You know, I, I don't think of it. Um, I guess I, I should address you as Meatloaf, even though I know you have a real name. Well, I've been called Meat my whole life. We used to do that as kids. We'd call each other, hey, Meat. Did you do that? Uh, but I don't know, kids. That's what they call me. Maybe that's where it came from. But my dad started calling me that first when did I was like a year old. Really? Yeah. Did, did, the, did the name Meatloaf grow out of your time in Dallas? Yes. Really? Yeah, Meat. I mean, that's what people call me. You just said we, we had a, a, a mutual friend that mm -hmm. I went to high school with. Mm -hmm. I, he would probably know me two ways, ML or Meat. Wow. And so that... Nobody ever questioned it when I was in school, no, because there, teachers would say, "Meet, did you do your homework?" You'd go to the, you know, you go to church on Sunday. Glad to see you here, meet. The preacher would say, and then you go to the doctor. You're not feeling good today, meet. What's wrong with you? You know, and and uh, I had a Jewish doctor, by the way. And so, uh, <laughs> and then when you reached puberty, you became Mr. Loaf. Well, no, I didn't become Mr. Loaf until I was doing Shakespeare in the Park for uh, Joe Papp, and I was doing a, a production of As You Like It with Raul Julia and Mary Beth Hurt, yeah. and. Uh, Clive Barnes, theater critic for the New York Times, uh, didn't like the production, but really liked Raul, myself, and Mary Beth, and said, Mr. Julia, uh, uh, Miss Hurt, and Mr. Loaf, and, and then, you know, some nice adjectives that followed that about our performances. So he was the first, and then after that, Douglas Watson did it, and then pretty soon, you know, even the West Side Times there in New York started calling me Mr. Loaf. Wow. And it wasn't until I got Seriously, and even as an actor, the only time I ever questioned it was when I was doing the first Shakespeare for, jo for Joe Papp. I went to Joe, I said, well, should we not use meatloaf? Well, you know, and he goes, well, of course we use a meatloaf. He said, and he said, do you think if Bill Shakespeare was alive today that he wouldn't use meatloaf? Of course he would, and he walked away. He would so embrace I, it. Yeah, he would embrace it. He would embrace it very much. I mean, he has, yeah, absolutely. I'm surprised I'm not in there. Isn't that funny? He's, he needs some rewrites. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I, I'm, uh, I have a million ideas floating in my head about this movie. One is just the whole, on, on the surface, the whole idea of that men and men are more and more disenfranchised and trying to find a place at least to express themselves as men or maybe even the masculine side of them because it's so cool to be a sensitive man in the 90s. But I, well, I think, I, I, I think that's, a, that's, that's a level. I think that's one level of it. But I, I, I think... I think it's deeper than that. I yeah, mean, I think it goes, I mean, of course, I mean, everybody yeah. says it, but I, but I think it not only just men, I think it deals with women, and I think it deals with, with fear, and it deals with self-esteem, and it deals with how you feel about your life, and needing some, some outlet, some, something that you feel like you're in control of instead of life being in control of you. It's like, it's like in the beginning of the movie, there's, there's the saying that, do you own possessions or do possessions own you? And in the beginning of this movie, the possessions are definitely owning, owning the Edward Norton character. And as happy as he thinks he is about owning these possessions, he's terribly unhappy about it. And because he, he's torn and he keeps talking about how he's almost completed his wardrobe and he's mm -hmm. talking about his Ikea furniture and his shopping. But at the same time, he can't sleep, hates his job, thinks he's wrong in what he's doing. And I'm... I'm Oh, sorry. Go ahead, have a drink. Oh, that's no, okay. okay. But there's no sense of, you know, people that want a sense of freedom, sometimes when they get that freedom, there's an enormous price to pay for that. Of kind of getting rid of everything, and then you get, and the movie, I think, brings a lot of that out. There's yeah, a, it there's does. A dark, there's an enormous, price. but you know, but there, there, there is a price. But you know what? That the, I don't think the price is too great to pay. Hmm. I don't think the price is too great to pay for feeling good about oneself. And I think that's the key here. It, and, and I don't think there's ever too high of a price for feeling good about yourself. I mean, I don't think it exists. I don't think you can pay too much for that. Uh, uh, it just doesn't, doesn't happen. You need, that's what people need, and that's what this movie deals with. And then, but it goes past that, and it gets into control. And when you think you have control, you really don't have control. So how do you come full circle and really have, have it all? And, and, the, and the way is, is basically to say, is be... The real simple t moral to this is be true to yourself. Mm. That's the real, the real thing. I mean, bottom line, you wipe everything out, and at the very end, he's standing there, and it's, he's, it's basically saying, you know what? I have to be who I am. I have to be true to myself. And that's what it is. And that's his release. Now, I, you know, I go on about, well, aren't the cops coming for him? <laughs> you know, yeah, when? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's what I said to Edward. I said, Edward, aren't the cops coming for you now? You know, it's just nice to see a guy from Thomas Jefferson in a big damn movie. Oh, it's really nice to this see a guy. This is better from... than Black Dog. You think it's I think better it's than Black Dog? I think it's a whole lot Dog? better. 